Hey everybody, it's Frankie Lou. I'm coming to you today from the big greenhouse at Highfield Farms. This is Mike Dorian. He's one of the founding members of the Highfield Farms, which is this really amazing facility here in the inner, innermost industrial part of the city. I do suggest that you take a look online to see what they're all about. But today, and I will be doing some videos, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> we'll be bringing you back. It's, it's an amazing project. It's very, very exciting. But today we're gonna talk about soil. And the reason we're talking about that today is I know that it's not quite time to start planting, but it is time to start planning. And um, one of the things that people don't think about when they're filling their garden beds is the life that's inside the garden bed besides plant life. And Mike knows all about that. So he's gonna tell us about some of the things that make your soil alive and why it's necessary to keep your soil alive. Yeah. So, so when, when we're looking at, so the, the, the biggest thing I always like to start with is just the fact of that difference between dirt and soil. Yes. So dirt on the other hand, so I do this little bucket test with the kids where I get them to put their hand in the bucket and feel in there and then give me, so you can see the dust already coming out of there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This dirt is dead. Doesn't have a whole lot going on for it. The structure. Right. Like we can plant a seed in here and that seed might grow, but mainly just from the energy of the seed itself. And then we're going to need a lot of help, a lot of outside inputs. Right. So that's where we're kind of looking at if you look at kind of convert commercial or conventional agriculture, or even just gardening, <laughs> it's almost treating the soil medium as like a hydroponic system. Right. So you're applying that, that fertilizer there and then hoping that the plant takes it up and then the rest of it just washes through the system. And then you have to do that again and again and again until the plant gets what it needs. So what, it, some, what if you were going to plant something in this, it's basically just providing almost a structure to hold the roots and that's it. And it's not even going to do much of that, is no, it? No, because no. because it doesn't have that much structure, it's going to end up getting compacted really fast and you're going to get some hard pans. So then, then we're not going to be able to get some good water and oxygen retention or even infiltration. And then that's going to lead to some some issues that the the roots won't be able to grow down there. Show us what are some things that we can do to help. If because I I know that a lot of my viewers and a lot of people who live here in the Calgary region, this is what it looks like if you put and then there's clay almost immediately below it. Yeah. Right. So, what can people do to maintain the health of their soil and keep it alive? Yeah. So one of the biggest ones is 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 you want to build up your organic matter. So if you build up the organic matter, so if we look at our soil as the basis of sand, silt, and clay, in whatever varying ratios that's gonna be, you know, some people are gonna have a lot heavier sand, some people are gonna have a lot heavier clay. They're all not bad, but they're all not good. It's all about ratios. Yeah. So if we can build our organic matter, then that helps kind of take the best of both worlds from all those different structures. So one of those ones is doing that is compost. Yes. Or we and you also- you guys know the, how much I love compost. We've yeah. lots of videos about that. Compost, and then what we've been using a lot in our operation is, is uh, the worm castings. So worm castings are essentially mother nature's fertilizer that is very similar to compost, but just the finished product is just a little bit more finer. And this is? This is worm castings. This is where we bring the nutrients, we bring the life, yeah. and then they are the ones that then feed the plant instead of us focusing on feeding the plant. And the other thing is, is this nutrition, because it's gone through the worms digestive system, it's more soluble to plants as well, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, so what, what happens is, so if we look at a plant root, that plant root can try to soak up some nutrients that are around it. And that's mainly happening when it's trying to pull up water. So if that nutrient is water soluble, it'll go up into the root with that plant. Yeah. But for the most part, a lot of the nutrients in the area, whether it's in the sand, silt, clay, or, or the organic matter, is in a form that the plant can't use. Mm -hmm. So it has to go through some critter, whether that's gonna be bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, or our earthworms. Right. And then they help, turn that into a nutrient cycling program that then now those nutrients are available to the plants and they can take that up. And that's happening all the time. Yeah. It's, it's going for that root to get food anytime it wants, not just when the 
farmer or the gardener comes out to, yeah. to, to feed them. Right. And then the other thing, and excuse my ignorance about this, but I'm assuming that we think of worm as a single entity, but it also contains bacteria in its gut, right? Yeah, big time. There's, okay. there's, there's bacteria within a worm's gut that you can't find anywhere else. And the neat thing too is a lot of people think that a worm gets its nutrition from like say a, a piece of leaf falls down and it eats that leaf. Yeah. They think we, we think that we're getting the nutrition from that, but it's actually getting its nutrition from the bacteria and the fungi that are trying to already decompose that. Right. So they're using their gizzard to squish all that stuff up and then they swallow all that cytoplasm and that's where they're getting what they need for their metabolic process. So that sounds like a pretty good segue about one of my favorites. <laughs> the mycorrhiza. Yeah. Now, I get a lot of questions all the time about this horrible white foamy stuff or there's mushrooms growing in my bed. What do I do? And and that's actually a good sign, isn't it? Oh, it's yes. a very, very good sign. Yeah. So when we look at what we want in our soil, and if we're in our soil digging or if we till our soil if, or if the soil is getting very compact, the first organism to get harmed is typically our fungi. Yeah. And it's just because it's very fragile. If we look at it's those beautiful. little tiny hyphae, yeah. when we can actually physically see it, that's many hyphae all bonded together and that's where we get that mycelium. Yeah. So its job, there's the two big ones that we look at. So the, there's the saprophytic, those are the, those are the ones that are gonna decompose some of this wood, or sorry, this uh, newspaper or any of this wood mulch if it was on the forest floor or when that big tree falls down, it's starting to eat at that. But then there's also the, the uh, mycorrhizal. Yeah. And that's going out and that's helping with some of the mining of the sand silk clay and the organic matter, but then bringing that back to the, the plant that it's working with and they've formed a symbiotic relationship to do like a lunch yeah. trade And you sometimes get nodules even on plants, right? Where where that is happening, where nitrogen in particular is being. Yeah, yeah. So, so where the mycorrhizal will form a symbiotic relationship with the root, there is bacteria that will form that relationship as well. And that's mainly with our legume species. Right. So we'll look at uh, perennials like the carragana, yeah. down to um, our peas, clovers, beans, um, and then they'll eat, they'll be using vetches and that kind of stuff out into the field as well. So. Okay, so my favorite, apart from the mycorrhiza, because I love it. These are yeah. these, and we also have you. You do a lot of worm bins, don't you? Yeah, we do lots of lots of worm bins. We've got the the operation down in Coaldale, and then we've got some stuff that we're doing here at the farm seasonally, and then. Once this greenhouse is up and going, we'll have some really cool things going on in here as well. And are these, these are red wigglers? Yeah, these are red wigglers. And I know a lot of people think, like, uh, I don't mind compost. I love digging through compost, but a lot of people find compost, the idea of it quite stinky and smelly. But I have found particularly with vermiculture that it doesn't have an, it, I, I, I like the smell. If you had one of these on your counter. Yeah, like it. It just smells like the forest floor and, and realistically that all comes down to specific, specifically if you're doing like a regular compost pile too, you're adding a certain amount of carbon or what we call browns in the compost world yeah. and then that helps create a, a good enough airflow and, and manages that moisture. So that's how we work with the odor issues with the compost pile. Yeah. So then with in a worm bin, we'd be looking at that carbon sources are bedding. Right. So the more bedding that you have in a worm bin, that's going to help uh, sustain that moisture, but then it's also going to act as a bit of a carbon filter if we do have anything in there kind of rotting, right? So I'm going to use my favorite dad joke. I can't say that composting is all about, it's not rocket science, it's rotting science. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Because there is some science involved. You do have to have a balance, right? Yeah. And uh, with a worm bin, what would you say of in this size? So how what, how many worms would you suggest putting in a? Uh, this is a. Yeah, with five, the, how many gallons is this bucket? Yeah, this bucket would be like a three and a half gallon bucket or, or so. Yeah. I would probably start with like a half a pound of worms in here, and you'd probably be able to get up to about a pound, a pound and a half, and then until they've kind of outgrown mm -hmm. this size, and then I would go into a Rubbermaid, or you could go into right. a deeper bucket. Okay, and then. 
how much waste do you think one of these? So they, they say a pound of worms will eat a pound of food a day. Whoa. But I like to take that back and say a pound of worms will eat half a pound of food a day because it, everything's about context. Okay. Right? So worms have small little mouths. Yes. So if you are making sure the food is really small, so some people will blend right. their food or yes, they'll cut I it up really small. Who, right? Who do that for their worms? They little, prepare little them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then they'll be able yeah. to process it faster. Uh, if the temperature, so because of the worms that we're using are not native to right. our, our land here, but these worms are originally from the Middle East. Okay. And the main reason why they're used in here is they like to hang out at the top layers of the soil. Right. As opposed to where ours like to tunnel down because, well, they're all sleeping and hibernating for the winter. Yeah, which are long them. here. Yeah. So if we tried to put them into this bin, they'd be like trying to tunnel because that's their instinct. Right. And it's like, where am I? I can't tunnel here. Yeah, I can't yeah, tunnel. Oh, yeah. get me out of here. Yeah. Okay. So with them, we're going to have them in that temperature range of like 15 to 25 degrees. And that's like the ideal for their metabolism to be up to that right. bar to be mowing down pretty good. So if you had this outside right now in our Calgary winter where today is a beautiful day, but you know, it's supposed to go down to minus 20 in the next couple of days and it's March, these won't survive, correct? Mm, that is correct. So these bins, I have one at home and I keep it inside during the winter months and we put it outside during the summer months yeah yeah and that's where it's becoming popular too is it gives people an option to take care of their waste stream and create an amendment to feed their plants within their condo or an apartment yes and we're getting more people living without access to a backyard or a space exactly that we're to. yeah so when i i always say that i'm a big fan of the three c's when it comes to keeping my soil alive so crop rotation companion planting and composting and so this, uh, and you can do tea with uh, as well, right? Yeah, you betcha. So worm castings, if you're purchasing them, do tend to be on the more... Yeah, there are the premium side yeah. for sure. But you can also create tea teas from that as well, which yeah. will make it go a lot first, farther, right? Yeah, those are usually called either uh, a, a worm casting extract or a worm casting compost tea. Right. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to get started, let's say they're building their first four by four, raised bed in their backyard this year if they only have access to their their topsoil that they took off what can they do to create a better soil bed for their garden and maybe encourage the mycorrhiza and encourage the worm cat you know what what would you suggest that somebody amend their new bed with totally so right off the bat first of all we never want to keep our soil just bare so we want to keep it covered, whether that's going to be with leaves or leaf mold or straw or anything like that. And then even like tickling a little bit of that into the soil surface, because then that's going to help that contact and decompose faster, which is going to build our organic matter within the soil. But that being said, would you recommend rototilling your garden every year? No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Okay. Because <laughs> that's, that goes back to our mycorrhizal My friends. They get yeah. beat up. Yeah. And now we have a highly bacterial soil, which actually triggers our weed seeds to germinate. Mm -hmm. So it all comes back to science again. Yes, our yeah. Critters. Yeah. So the no-till method, it's sort of layering more closely, replicating what much Mother Nature does, right? Because she does know what she's doing. Yeah. And uh, so when you're building a new bed, then you want to have a lot of that leaf litter or something on top of that. And what would you recommend that people put into their soil? For their first year or second year or whatever to try to increase the nutrition that's in there and the solubility of that nutrition for their plants totally so it'll come down to budget mm -hmm. so if somebody if somebody has a little bit of a higher budget then what i would do is i would get a bit of worm castings and then to really make sure that you're getting the bang for your buck is when you're putting in your seed florals or your transplant bowls just sprinkle it right in with the seed or right with the transplant mm -hmm. Okay. So when that seed germinates, boom, they've got their friends right there they get right. to work with, and same with the transplants. Okay. If you don't have as much, that's where, you know, getting just a basic compost, mixing it in, maybe you would get a little castings to do, do a little bit less. Do some tea maybe? You could do a tea, so then you can take that cup, so you can take a cup load of worm castings and make a five gallon pail of liquid extract that you can then spread that right. out a lot further. Okay. 
All right, any last tips that you got, Mike? Um, any last tips? Yeah, just be gentle with the soil and, and don't be afraid to experiment because I think we get we get all like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to wreck anything, or I don't want to try. But we have yeah. to, we have to observe what we're doing, play yeah. around with it, and and experiment, and and just be kind to the soil because the relationship of what's going on in the soil with that alive critters is very similar to the same thing that's in our gut. Exactly. So if we're kind to the soil, we're ultimately being kind to ourselves. And I always, when, when I'm doing my school programming, so I always like to tell the kids that when they take, if you take it, it's, it's, your soil is a living thing. And this much soil contains as much living entities in it as the entire population of humans on this planet. <laughs> right? And I know that's a hard one, to, but when you do things like stick your soil in the oven to try to kill, you're killing more than just the fungus gnats. You're killing all this wonderful stuff that's going to help your plants absorb the nutrition. Just for a little plug, you do, through your Living Soil Solutions, do also sell worm castings and mycorrhiza and products like that as yeah, well, right? Yeah, yeah. All the products we do are all natural to, to increase or support the biological portion of the soil. And they're all natural and everything. I usually put them on my kid's face and if right. she doesn't get a rash, then I know I can sell it and it's all good. I'm calling Chuck. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mike. This has been very, very informative. I'm glad you talked about it today because you have uh, much more experience with this than I do. And um, as always, do let me know if you have any comments or questions for Mike or myself. And as always, we hope you take this chance to grow together today. Have a good one. Take care.